but I believe every every culture have got those you know, um, those um, herbs, herbs and anything that you need alternatives from in that culture. I was being drawn to and recognising the doubts that I'd been kind of, I'd experienced as a child and they were coming back to me and I could no longer ignore these things. Some people, yeah, they do want to go therapy, they do want scout theatre, they do want the mental and emotional wellbeing support, but allocating to them to the right practitioner is a, is a task in itself. Welcome to another episode of the Leading Communities podcast, a platform where we help develop discussions on topics vital to local communities, offering insights from both leadership perspectives and the community viewpoint. Join us as we explore the issues, stories and experiences that shape our communities and inspire change. Our guests this afternoon have a commitment to caring for both the body and mind. We have Ria and Elka who are both passionate advocates for wellness with a holistic approach. And we have Jas Curran, who is the CEO and founder of A Mindful Message, which is a multilingual mental health service. Good afternoon all. Afternoon. So, um, all about the body and the mind. I'd love to know, um, starting with yourself, Elka, um, a little bit about the work that you do and why holistic health is important to you. So I, I do a massive wide range of things and it's, sometimes it's hard for me to put it into words because it's just part of my life. It's not necessarily for me a service it's just who I am. Um, but I do offer support on a mental, emotional, spiritual and physical um, level, really. I'm, yeah, the reason why I like to address or approach well-being on all of these levels is because for me, I don't believe that any of these things are separate. All of them assist and complement each other. If your physical well-being is out of sync, it's going to affect your emotional, mental and spiritual well-being. And the same with all the others. All of them are interlinked. And so, yeah, I can't ignore the physical body and go straight to the spiritual body. It just doesn't work like that in my experience. Okay. Um, Ria, I know that you've turned your holistic approach to um, health into and wellness into a business. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes. So I'm looking at holistic beauty in particular. Um, the reason I call it holistic is because your well-being is kind of shown on your skin. Mm. So how well, how well your organs are, you can basically see it on the skin. So it's not always just about the outer beauty. Mm. And the reason I call it holistic is because the skin is permeable, so like I explained to you earlier as well, 70% of what you put on your skin goes straight into your body, 100% of what you put on your underarms or your private parts also goes straight into the body. So something that might be good for the skin might not necessarily be good for your organs once it's entered the body. Mm. So we have to be equally mindful of what we put on our skin as what we're consuming because your skin is also consuming. Mm. So what I have noticed, a lot of people are very, you know, e even the people who ha lead a very healthy lifestyle, they ignore the part that the skin is a part of the healthy lifestyle. So they might be eating, you know, very good food and, you know, exercise and all of that, but then they, re then they realise, why am I getting certain conditions? A lot of new age diseases is actually directly linked to it without, without knowing, without always going into too much detail and, you know, pointing at anyone. Um, me, myself, when I had cyst um, at a very young age, when I went to the doctors, the only thing I was told, oh, it happens, a lot of women get it. And I'm like, I haven't heard that word before, you know, I, mm. I studied biomed and I know I had people in my family who's never heard of that word as well, like, what is it? They're like, oh, it's a normal thing, everyone gets it. I'm like, well, when you say everyone can get it, I still want to know how, because I'm sure there is a cause for it. But I did not want to answer it. But luckily, I had some really good professors at that time, because I was at uni, I went back. They're like, you can test the tissues if you want, ask them to test the tissues. And initially, they, did, they said no, but after a lot of fight, you know, some of the ingredients they found in it was all in my skincare products. Wow. And it has been, that's when I started looking more into that. So obviously, like, my 
my degree it helped me with understanding the basic of skin mm. but then going more into it it kind of helped me to find a more healthier way to look at things a healthier perspective mm. so then I started looking more into it and I thought you know what it surely can't be right and the amount of lawsuits and cases I found against skin companies where again and again that have been proven to do harm but then because they had the money they even bought out scientists and doctors in court but there's been like a one of case Johnson and Johnson case which I'm yeah. assuming a lot of people know where they weren't able to buy people out and it's still there anyone can go and have a look even the documentaries and everything all the details that's everything is there but mm -hmm. you know when you realize that it happens to yourself that's when you realize like you know what then they're like we're going to operate it I'm like no if it's a paired on its own I'm sure I can get rid of it as on its own mm. western medicine is amazing I'm going to say for emergency situations but when it comes to long long-term healthy life mm. I think there are alternative ways that we should be looking at mm. And there is, um, obviously you can touch on a lot of things, I'm specifically focusing on skin because I just did that in my final year and I'm, I was always into makeup and stuff and I still wear makeup once in a while and I'm like, can't you just do something, make it something natural? So obviously it's just giving the option, isn't it? Because sometimes you can't just always go and say, oh, just love yourself how you are. And I'm like, but it's easier sometimes said it's easier said than done because not mm. everyone has that confidence. I don't always have the confidence. Like, on an everyday basis, yes, I could go without makeup, but places like this, I want to be wearing that. Mm. And, you know, you, you want that self-care as well, but why does that self-care have to be toxic? Why can't that be in a natural way? There is ways, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So you can always replace anything that is already, you know, yeah. out there um, in a more holistic way, whether it be like, you know, um, skincare, makeup. I have recently spoken to a few girls who's actually looking into doing makeup mm. and you know that how their nail polish and everything is coming out more natural size as well. That could have done it before, but because of the more awareness now, I think more people are looking at alternative ways of doing it. Mm. So rather than not using it, looking for alternative ways that is gonna, you know, um, benefit you in mm. a healthy way. And that is like one of my reasons why I turned towards that. Okay. So I wouldn't advise anyone, whatever you're doing, carry on doing it until you have the option to do it in a better way, mm. obviously. And that's where I think everyone should come together and, you know, have that understanding. Sounds Andrews. good. Your focus, your business is focused a little bit more around mental well-being. What's been your motivation behind that? Um, so similarly from uni, I completed my thesis on the like, the barriers which within my community people were facing accessing mental health support. So two of the main things that I found were culture and language and the, my main drive for it is because I gave my questionnaire to my dad and when seeing that the fact that as a proud man he actually wanted to get support but what he couldn't kind of overcome was the language. I was like well how can I support that do you know what I mean? Mm. So I set out to do that and that's what my service supplies it's a multilingual mental health therapy so all on our all on our recruitment side of things we are recruiting psychotherapists counselors coaches and mentors who are from a different cultural background and speak a different language as each of you were speaking i was thinking um about some cultural resonance that will sit behind the services that you do and even your thought process around that Coming back to the, the holistic well-being for a moment, and I mean, you touched on the spiritual being linked to the physical and that being linked to the mental and the emotional. Um, how, has, how has culture impacted um, your approaches and also the education that you share around holistic health? Um, does it have an impact? It absolutely, absolutely does have an impact. Um, for me, um, my upbringing definitely had an impact in my, on my own um, journey and that's why I do what I do. It's all based around my own experience and the things that I lacked um, growing up and then, and then coming out of um, like a religious, a, a religious up, upbringing really and my search for my own um identity as such and spiritual the spiritual connection was really important for me i always had this deep kind of longing to be in connection with god and being raised in a religious family and community that was my understanding of that and then coming out of that 
I kind of felt like I'd lost it. So then I became, it kind of turned around and then I was on a whole different journey all by myself. Um, but then being part of a community and your culture, I feel is re still really important. Um, now I'm in a place where I can come back to the community from a different mindset and bring what I've learned into that as well. And then finding that there's so many people that feel lost, mm -hmm. but are also afraid to take the steps to journey a little bit deeper into themselves. And these kind of things um, will affect your mental and emotional well-being as well, mm -hmm. because you can start to feel very um, trapped and stagnant and feel like there's no purpose in your life. And then it just kind of, you just live in a very um, meaningless kind of cycle. That's what I find. For you, what instigated your, I want to call it the, a light bulb moment, and that might not be the right way of putting it, but you know that moment where, or that event that makes you realise there is a connection between all of these things and puts you on the journey to understand more about what's going on, which then in turn puts you on the journey to teach others. If you don't mind sharing, what was that? Sharing, but we're going to go real deep if we do. <laughs> um, so to me, I don't really ever recall a light bulb moment. Mm. I feel like it was a um, very much a gradual kind of journey. It was like the undoing of a programmed mindset. And it took many years, um, but there was something inside me that was really pulling me on to this path that I was also conditioned to stay away from. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk freely about myself. I was raised in a Christian household. Um, and as a Indian, um, I got to a stage where it was almost like, it didn't quite make sense to me anymore as I became a, a young, I say a young adult. Um, which was really confusing for me because I also loved, I loved going to church and I loved God and I loved what I did. Like I used to dream of just living in church because I just wanted to be close to God. Mm. Um, and then I got to a stage where I was being drawn to and recognizing the doubts that I'd been kind of I'd experienced as a child and they were coming back to me and I could no longer ignore these things and um, so for me it was slowly slowly like facing these fears in a sense and opening doors that I was afraid to open but also whilst I was doing that I was simultaneously learning how to listen to my intuition which was my gut feeling. Mm. Um, and that was the thing that I kind of stuck with is like, if my gut's telling me it's okay, then it's okay. If my gut tells me no, I'm gonna listen, even if it doesn't make sense up here. Mm. Sometimes our logic makes sense. So, so we go with the logic and we ignore what's inside of us. And to me, I believe that that, that gut feeling or the intuition is the part of God inside of you that is actually guiding you. So yeah. I hope that's okay to go there. No, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm passionate about, really. I believe that, you know, um, we all have God inside of us. And for me, what I like to do is recognize that all of these things, the mental health, the emotional health, the spiritual health and the physical health, there is something inside of you that is telling you the truth. But there's so much around us that is distracting us and telling us lies, mm. you know what I mean? And so the fight is, the fight really is between everything that's outside of us and what's inside of us as well, mm. so. No, thank you for that. And, and I, I guess that you both to an extent can relate to, to what Elka was saying. Um, Ria, I wanna come to you for a moment because obviously you're more focused on holistic beauty. Yeah. And again, as women, in general wellness, yeah and yeah, exactly and wellness but thinking about as women in general and then also just thinking again about cultural aspects in terms of 
present presentation, how we present ourselves, what we're taught to do, how we're brought up to think about maybe aspects of beauty and what that looks like. How have you been able to sort of translate that? Because I'm sure there will be times when you've had backlash or challenges around the, the messages that you're sending around, say, you know, what beauty and wellness should be and what the connection between those two things are. Because I'm sure there's been many, and I know I've been guilty, but the focus is the external. We're not yeah. thinking about the internal. Definitely, yes. Um, so some of the challenges I've had is to do with um, how much people have educated themselves before they come to me. And because of how the beauty industry is moving at the moment, it's all fast beauty. So they want instant results. So if you haven't actually got like a basic understanding of the health and skin connection, you would just walk into my clinic and it wouldn't be for you because you will come in there and you're going to think, I'm going to do a facial and you're going to look amazing within 60 minutes. You're not because I'm not going to be doing a chemical peel on you. I'm not going to be putting any chemicals on you. It's going to take time because you'll be working with your body. And there are certain conditions I would just turn around and say, look, I can do 10 facials on you and it's not going to get any better because the problem is inside. You have to work on that before and you know whatever I do can only go hand in hand with that, mm. not solely help with the skin issue because like I mentioned, some of it is directly related to a gut tissue or any other organ issues that you have within you. So that needs to be healed first. So that's where I mainly got backlashes, but people are not happy with that. They're like, well, we just come for a facial. I'm like, if you come for a relaxation purpose, then I can do it. But if you come for a skin concern, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, there is a deeper root cause. The approach I use as well, because obviously I have gone into more towards the Ayurvedic side of things because that's where, that's what I had access to. Mm. But I believe every, every culture have got those, you know, um, those um, herbs, herbs and anything that you need alternatives from in that culture, like just trying to educate people so they need to kind of understand what I'm offering because I'm not only offering beauty, I'm offering you good health as well mm. at the same time. When reflecting on mental health services, again, um, you know, I, I do feel like there's cultural aspects to that. Um, and similarly to what you're describing, in fact, what you've both described so far, is that when you're in a space where you're not dealing with something that is a quick fix, and mental health very often isn't. Uh, again, how does that influence the, yes, the cultural aspects, but also how then you go about um, being able to tackle some of the challenges in delivering those services? Um, I'd say that comes from a strategic level when dealing with, for example, the National Healthcare Service at the moment. Um, you have CAMS, you have IAPT, you have a lot of things that are one, the structure of it, the framework of it is very westernised. So I went to a PPN, which is a psychological professionals network meeting, signed up on Eventbrite for anyone who wants to sign up. <laughs> and one of the questions that I asked um, them was within, within the five year forward plan, looking at the UK and the mental health and how it wants to go forward, how are they incorporating support for people with a cultural background? Because there are things that support within the NHS, for example, um, that they're not privy to. Like if you do training when you're signing up, you'll have stuff that are like abuse that are on there. One of those things are spiritual abuse. Now, coming from a person who has not been from a faith background or anything like that, that's abnormal to them. So how are they supposed to keep a certain person safe within that setting mm. uh, from a practitioner's point of view mm -hmm. within that service? So that is one of the questions when I said about a cultural framework, how do you allocate clients to the right practitioner, because some people, yeah, they do want to go therapy, they do want health, they do, they do want the mental and emotional well-being support, but allocating to them to the right practitioner is a, is a task in itself, because somebody who needs CBT, for example, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, is changing your negative thought processes into positive ones, or someone who needs person-centered therapy, where they just want to explore their emotions. Mm -hmm. But if you place a person with the wrong practitioner, they're going to focus on the wrong things. And then again, it comes, it was a waste of time. I only went for a few sessions, but then I came back home. Mm -hmm. And these are the, like, that's the feedback that I'm getting from so many clients of, I did try it in the past, but I didn't want to go because it failed me at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when you start to have like a service, for example, like a mindful message, what I am trying to do from the foundation side of things, creating a blueprint of not just, um, helping that person psychoeducationally, providing that support for them, 
but giving them a framework where they can support themselves after. Mm -hmm. Not in a horrible way. I just don't want to see you after 12 sessions. You know what I mean? I want to be confident in knowing the fact that you can go home afterwards. Absolutely. Um, so when talking about like, our cultural perspective again, bringing it back there, it was the allocation process has to be very important when you're putting clients and practitioners in a room together from a mental health perspective. Because mm -hmm. if you're eliminating that factor, you're eliminating something that they may need support with. What I find interesting, so to give context to the question I'm now going to ask you, um, I myself have worked in um, community radio and worked in a radio environment which is very much focused on communities. So there's a lot of statistics that I've come across over the years that tend to talk about black and Asian communities faring worse whenever it comes to health issues, chronic health issues, mental health issues and more importantly tapping into the appropriate forms of support which you've just touched on there. What challenges do you have as practitioners, as deliverers, as business owners when it comes to tackling the mainstream viewpoint of the service and the, and the, the practice that you have but knowing that you're dealing with probably aspects within the community that are just a little bit more heightened than normal. I mean, you've touched on it, but if I can bring it back to sort of the, the, the wellness side. What I'm saying in essence is that you have a mainstream community yeah. that isn't necessarily serving our individual communities particularly well. And that's because there's a lack of understanding or there is potentially a mistrust, but somewhere there's a mismatch between what the mainstream community is providing, i.e. Mm. whether that be, that could be conventional health services. You gave an example, you had a cyst, you've gone to the doctor, the doctor has said, oh, this, this is normal, this happens, mm. it's quite happy to send you away. From your point of view, both as, I suppose, a woman and then a woman of colour, mm. those things st statistically impact you more. You've dug a little bit deeper. I'm asking, whether you feel that that has heightened the challenges that you have when you're trying to actually deliver your services and, and teach. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say particularly in what I do because mm -hmm. it's more to do with like skincare and it's natural skincare, mm -hmm. but I would, I would say that's more to do with um, makeup industry probably okay. rather than what I'm doing because I haven't had that personally because my, my products kind of cater for everyone because it's yeah. just natural. No, that's fair. How about yourself? The challenge really is that for so many years, <clears throat> our parents and grandparents, they have uh, become more accustomed to trusting the experts and the professionals and they would rather go there and whatever the doctor signs off for them, they're just going to keep taking those pills and they don't even know what it is. And then before you know it, they're suffering side effects and they're taking more pills. And, you know, it's just they just do what they're told. Um, and there's still a massive percentage of people that do that. And even though we are coming into a time where actually, like you said, we're more open education is a lot more accessible now like um so there is there is more information out there for us to explore natural remedies you know which i'm 100 percent. that's the route that i'm going down like you said though i do feel like when in a in, a, in an emergency i'm not going to say don't go to the hospital if you break your arm or whatever or you know I do feel like, yes, mainstream can assist in some ways, but I do think ultimately the challenge is to take your own health into your own hands and be responsible for your own body and your own mind and, and spirit and, and um, emotions also. But because we've become so used to everything being a quick fix, people just, they don't, they haven't got the patience to go down the route of, okay, I've been abusing my body for like 30 years and now I've got this illness. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do to, to um, you know, make myself better? They'll go to the hospital or they'll go to the doctors and they'll take the treatments, which 
they also are aware are still not 100% guaranteed, mm. but they'd rather do that than actually, actually, if I was to change my diet or to take up these practices, I could actually heal my body and have no side effects, but they're, they'd rather go the quick route and risk the side effects and actually take all the pain. I know people that would rather go and have an operation, then they're having infections, then they're suffering, then they're taking more pills, then stop eating meat or dairy or sugar or takeaways. Like, why is it so hard? But they're just so, it's like they're bad habits. They don't realize how bad these habits are. They are addictions. They're addicted to things, but because they're not cigarettes or alcohol or drugs, they don't see them as, as um, you know, they don't see them as addictions. They don't see how they're actually poisoning themselves in so many ways. But yeah, that's the challenge. Is a lack of education a big problem? And is it difficult when in your shoes, your educators around this, these subjects, and you will talk to people about mental well-being and physical well-being and how all of these things link, but there isn't necessarily mainstream, necessarily mainstream support for your message, making it harder? Is that a, is that a thing? I, I do think coming from, you know, uh, a culture that's um, very much programmed to trust somebody that um, has a degree or is not a person of colour. It's easier for them to say, oh, they know better because they've just, they've been conditioned that way. Um, we can say the same thing, but as soon as somebody who's not a person of colour says it, they're more likely to listen to them. But also, it, it's that same thing. They, they just value the opinion of someone who's more, who's Western or European mm. than the opinion or the advice of someone who's not. Mm. I was just going to add on to that. I don't think it's a, a lack of education. I think it's an access of education. Mm. Like, if you think about schools, for example, um, in the UK, they have a curriculum from nine till three. Nowhere in that curriculum is actually learned, like teaching those kids of how to be emotionally intelligent or look after themselves within time periods where, unfortunately, there aren't going to be adults there to look after you. You are going to have to, like on the school playground, if you're getting bullied or you're, you know, having cyberbullying, for example, social media is a whole thing. People are sending nudes and stuff in school and being exposed in so many different ways. There are no education for kids to be able to support themselves in that way. I went to um, Nishkam mm. for the first year of sixth form. It's when they were first starting out. And one hour out of the week, I think, yeah, I think it was one hour or two hours out of the week, they had a period called enrichment period. And that was where you discuss certain things of like what was going on, like if they one of the kids and stuff, what, what they wanted to do. And that was a thing for me. I'm like, I'm glad that they did that because that gave themselves to build themselves. And when I speak to the year sevens of that generation, so kind of my friends that I grew up with from the year 12 generations, but then you've got the year sevens and growing up and seeing them grow after like seven years later and saying, okay, what did you get out of school? Those were the sort of things that they can like come back with within the community. Yeah. Um, when you're saying about the challenges as well, um, like culturally in the mainstream, I would say, again, it's about that education of access to education. How much access are we getting to people who make those decisions? We're not because they're staying in the places where you make those decisions. How much access are you getting in the community? You won't, the people need to break the mold in order for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because your service is obviously multilingual yeah. mental health care. And I think it was high, probably emphasised during COVID more than at any point that there wasn't enough multilingual health services in general. Yeah. Um, and that obviously had a huge impact on how communities understood what mm -hmm. COVID meant, how they were accessing support for it, and even the numbers then that were translated into those falling ill or, you know, or, or actually um, dying, unfortunately, from COVID. So many barriers. 
Well, I was just going to say, has that gotten any better when you're thinking about being in a space where you're serving a community that has already been, uh, and serving in a way that's already been identified as lacking? You, you're you doing it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Business, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, you're doing it. But is your business getting the support it needs, the resources it needs, the access to what you require to actually do that as meaningfully as you could? Not unless I'm fighting for it. Right. So if I'm not getting up, for example, my routine now is being a part of that four to five a.m. club, and I still got to feed myself and feed my family at the same time in order to break surface. For me, a mindful message is purpose, so it's very purpose-led. So I need to fill my cup in order to serve one, my company, the people within the company, and the clients accessing that care. So. If I know I'm getting up at 4 a.m., making sure that happens, how much, and I'm banging down doors every single day, it's like an everyday process, it will get easier. And I think it's the tenacity that I have within me that pushes me every single day. Whereas when you're talking about access and the support, like I've sat with commissioners of different organisations, I've sat with university leads, board members, and it comes down to, again, that, that word funding, mm -hmm. that word access for government funding or like grants and all these different things. And it's an allocation of those funds that are an issue. And I'd, it's, again, I'd say it's just a whole journey that as an entrepreneur, as a person that's a woman and a female person of colour within business, that I am just growing through. Mm. Um, yeah. What challenges, and this is to each of you, what challenges have you faced, do you face, when you understand the amount that you understand about wellness and its holistic nature, but then you are banging doors every day? I would kind of add on to what Alcoa was saying earlier, is to do the challenges is um, people just want to see a title and a position for mm. them to decide what they want to list. Science is a great tool, but it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't override history and common sense and what's been working. And, you know, it should kind of um, be a part of it and assist us with understanding better rather than just taking over it completely. Because mm. even science the basic of it is that it's always changeable and there's no you know a definite answer which is why that always have researchers ongoing all the time and it's done in a controlled environment and you can never apply that to everyone and yeah. um, and that's another another place where um, race and culture and all of that comes in as well because that differs from race to race and culture to culture as well yeah. so obviously it depends where that study is done who's done it who was the participants the age and everything and also people are evolving so when it comes to that so it's, I think people are just more focused on who is saying it rather than what is what being, being said, said. Yeah. Yeah. touching what you said about race to race though as well when you're saying about challenges one of the main challenges is for me being a leader of my own company is getting people to come forward to actually get so how a mindful message works as an outcome measure is getting those outcome measures, psychometric assessments. Every two sessions, we take a well-being scale to see if there's any improvements mm -hmm. over the 12 sessions that a client would come on board with. And when I'm talking to people from South Africa, Kenya, I'm waking up in Brazil, like on Google Meets and stuff and speaking to all these people, they used... When you're growing up and you can speak a different language, you're from a different culture, you're seen as it's seen as a weakness sometimes because you feel different, right? It's giving practitioners that confidence to come forward to say, yes, you can speak another language and you can support somebody. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just speak English to do that. Mm. That's one of the challenges, obviously, I've been facing as well, Ronnie. Yeah, I can imagine. How do you take care of your own well-being? Great. Do whatever I need to do. <laughs> um, how do I take care of my own? But someone asked me that the other day, actually. Um, I think, well, number one, um, not over committing. Um, I think we work really hard, and for some reason, we've been encouraged and it's been glamorized to be busy. And, oh, busy is good. Oh, I've just been really busy. Oh, busy is good. No, it's not. Busy is not good. You're overworking your body. You're overworking your mind. You're overworking your whole... Im you're not giving yourself time to rest. Your body needs rest. You need to sleep. You need to have a good good quality when you're off sleep as well. You need to be able to 
make good healthy food for yourself and not have to be getting food on the go all the time and spending time with your friends and your family like these are all really healthy practices but they're overlooked so much because they're they're just seen as so basic like they're not that important and we will override that because we get a phone call and and that's money and i'm not saying that we shouldn't prioritize money because we all gotta pay bills because we live here but um, I do think that we need to start looking at the very basics of our everyday life and make sure that we are taking time out for our own health, whether it's spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. Um, it's really important. So yeah, I'm kind of getting back into being less busy now because, um, no, less not busy because I really, I like to make sure that I am spending time in my garden and cooking and I love to pot plants and, you know what I mean? The, the real um, basic things that they'd say, oh, that's what old people do and you get old and you start looking after your garden. Actually, it's so therapeutic. Mm. Yeah, it's what we need to do. We need to spend time connecting with nature. Mm. And that's the other thing that I feel is really like it's been stripped from us is our connection to nature that is that is so important for our health and well-being everybody on this planet needs to connect with nature mm. okay. Raya? um i would say obviously apart from trying to not eat out and the diet and all of that <laughs> things which is very hard for me but you know it's probably a major major thing i do um radiation detox quite often that helps me mm. to calm my mind where I literally just switch my phone off for one week and I'm like, just don't contact me, <laughs> just block a time off, you know, that I'm actually not like touching my phone. Mm -hmm. And to take that a step further, just to stay away from all the radiation around us, because radiation poisoning is a thing and it's only getting worse and worse with electric cars and smart meters and I could go on forever. Vipassana meditation, this is probably for everyone that is listening as well. If you ever wanted to get away, it's a free meditation center you can go for one week mm -hmm. if you're going after that you need to be a part of it and do some voluntary work but the first time you go one week is actually free you stay in the middle of nowhere i think it's past chester or somewhere and they take you in the middle of like the forest and there's like a building and you're there you're meditating and doing yoga they take all your phones off there's no laptop you're not allowed to talk for a week <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was away. really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it was the first few days I was literally trying to run away and the security was like, you can't leave, you know, you signed up for a week. But I have to say, every time I come out of it, like, I've only done it twice, it's amazing. Because after the one week, you just, you're so calm, your mind is so calm and you're just so clear and, you know, you can just get back to work and it feels like, I can't even explain that feeling. It's just no noise in your head. How do you take care of your health? Because you, you made a point about you have a company where you're looking, you, you've got your own family, your own responsibilities, you have a company, you've got staff, then you've got, um, you know, clientele. That, that's a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Um, again, so I fill my own cup first. So when I, like, okay, you touched on it about spirituality, emotional, mental, physical. Um, so I kind of practice what I preach. So if I'm intaking, if you think about renewing your mind with scripture, everything that you're listening to. So in the morning, med like motivational videos, putting myself back in perspective. First thing in the morning, saying my affirmations, writing down my gratitude journal. And it's really like setting the tone of what am I doing? What is my purpose for mm. today? Mm. Um, I mean, when you're talking about God, I always kind of just say, God, use me, my, my ears, my mind, my mouth. And in those in those moments, it's where I am grounded in that instance. Um, and when we're talking about emotional well-being, um, increasing my emotional intelligence, putting in those boundaries professionally, personally, self-care. So there's seven elements of self-care. Any of my mentees, if they even decide to, or clients, they'll say, yeah, she does. It's the first thing that I do. If you mm. sign up, um, okay, what's your self-care regime? And it's seven elements of it that people are thinking, oh, I thought I did a lot, but actually you're not even doing that much. Mm. Um, ensuring that I'm that word stability so everyone wants to be stable but in all different aspects um, so if I know I'm working for myself I'm accountable and I take ownership for everything that I do mm -hmm. so if I'm taking time out for myself how is it that financially I'm going to be stable so I'm ensuring that I'm not just having one source of income I'm allowing myself to have those breaks so I know things are running and I don't have my mind running in that in that way mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of 
like when I speak to, so I surround myself with a lot of people that are older than me, and when they're talking about retirement ages, that's what they that, that's what they speak about. It's mm. actually knowing the fact that you can be financially free and have that life that you want. Mm. And that's what my kind of drive for me, and that's how I take care of myself, to be honest with you. I have a whole vision board, so I make sure I align myself. Um, and yeah, that's a non-stop thing. I think people just think that you know, one day it just gets easier. Life doesn't get easier, you just get tougher. Um, and that's how I look after that, increase my mental toughness. One thing that I do is read a lot and journal a lot. So I recommend a book called You Are You by Dr. Eric Thomas. And he has a lot of journal prompts at the end of each chapter, mm -hmm. which takes away that victim mindset that sometimes that we all experience, oh, why me? And like, it's, I flip the script of, okay, so why not me? If, it, mm. if this is the card and this is the situation that you dealt with, you kind of face it head on. Mm. Um, so when I take care of myself, I have to take myself all day. You've learned that, you learn that as you go on. And I think running a multilingual mental health service, you speak to so many different people across the whole world and you pick up things, you pick up techniques, interventions, therapies. I didn't know the abundance of information that is out there unless you go out there and like attain it. You can't, you don't know otherwise, do you? <laughs> well, what I hear, uh, three women who are very mindful about what health feels like, looks like, um, and entails for you individually and for the people that you serve um, and the ways in which you do serve. Um, it's been very enlightening, thank you. And thank you for thank you indulging so uh, all of my questions. Um, Elka, Rhea, Jas Karen, I you. wish you all the very best moving forward. Look forward to learning more about the, the approaches that you have and the interventions and changes that you're making through the commitment and the work that you do and the education more so than anything else. I do hope that this episode has been insightful and enlightening and given food for thought on how whether we are as individuals can make improvements to how we improve our own wellness approach or think about the provisions or policies that can be put in place to support the many communities and the unique needs of those communities and those serving those unique needs because of their understanding. Uh, so I do hope that that provides value for you in the same way that it has for us here. And we look forward to another episode of the Leading Communities podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to keep up to date with all things Leading Communities.